We're really very pleased tonight to have two members of our state archaeology, archaeology team uh, who's with us to present our program. Uh, Dr. Chip McGinsey is our state archaeologist and he's the director. <laughs> he is the director of the Louisiana Division of Archaeology. Ms. Carla Ose, next to him, is the collection manager. She's the collection manager in that division, which all of this operates under the State Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Dr. McGimsey will tell us a little bit about the Morgan Mounds excavation and what was found there, but probably more importantly, he's going to tell us what's been learned about the people who live there and elsewhere within the Chenier Plain. And the Chenier Plain runs from Cameron Parish through Vermilion, pretty much right along the coast. Uh, Ms. Ose will share information about the artifacts that are contained in our Morgan Mound collection and show us some of those individual items which she has on display here. And both of them will be available for questions, answers uh, at the end of their program. So without any further, I'll hand it over to Dr. All right. And I'm going to try not to trip on the cord to make a fool out of myself. <laughs> well, I have to say I'm impressed. I haven't given a presentation to this many people in a long time. Um, this is really nice of you all to come out and uh, hear what Carla and I had to, to tell you. So, um, as he said, I'm going to start off with sort of a general introduction to the Shamir Plain and sort of what the land and the and what people saw when they started living down here. But we're gonna focus on what was found at the Morgan site um, and what we learned about what life was like a long time ago. So let's see here. Can everybody hear the doctor? Anyone need a little more volume? Can I hold this any closer? There you go. <laughs> I'm used to yelling. I'm not used to speaking into one of these things. <laughs> So, two more chairs in the front, two chairs. Yeah, we've got two spots up front for anybody who wants. Um, so, many of you probably know what we call the Chenier Plains in Louisiana. Um, it's this stretch from essentially the area from White Lake and Grand Lake and over um, out towards the coast. And the reason it's called the Chenier Plain is because there are that well-known series of ridges that run through there. Most of this is marsh, but there are these linear ridges. This is Pecan Island here. Of course, you have Grand Chenier. But you can see on this photograph, there's a whole series of other ridges back here. <clears throat> and those are commonly known as the Cheniers. This is a map that shows all of the ones that exist. And you can see there are actually quite a few of them. What you may not realize is that the Cheniers actually represent old shorelines. They represent where the ocean used to be at some point in the past. Um, and so you can actually look at the history, the geologic history of Louisiana in this area anyway. So the oldest, where's, the oldest Chenier is Little Chenier and Little Pecan Island back here. And as best we can tell, that probably formed about somewhere around 3,000, 2,800 years ago. So, <clears throat> up at that point, all of this ground was underwater. And so that would have been the very first shoreline. And many of you may not realize how the chenires form. That is, you have mud coming from the Mississippi River. You're being carried by the coastal currents along here. And it basically gets deposited along the shoreline here. And so if you've got more dirt coming in than the waves are washing out, then, of course, the land builds outward into the sea. Um, <clears throat> but if that balance changes just a little bit, such that the waves are now starting to erode more than the currents are bringing in, then you get erosion. And what happens is that the fine grain sediments, the silts and the clays, get washed out. But the coarser stuff, like sands and shells and you know the tar balls and whatnot, tend to stay and get washed up onto the shore. And that's what forms the chenier. So when you look at this, 
basically what you're seeing is here is the original shoreline, then the, the land built out some way, and then it eroded back and created Chenier Purdue. We built out again, then it went back, created Pumpkin Ridge, it came out again, created little Chen or, um, the Grand Chenier Con Island complex. So there's this whole sequence of building out, eroding back, building out, eroding back. And if you go, uh, most of you I'm sure have been down there, but this is what one of the chenilles looks like. It's a little ridge, anywhere from almost no feet above sea level uh, to about five feet at the maximum height. Uh, and it's just this line of vegetation, trees grow there, um, running through the marsh. So if you go down to Rockefeller Refuge and you have the fortitude to park and walk all the way down to the coast, you can see one of these chenilles forming today. Um, that section of the coast has actually eroded back well over a mile in the last 250 years. Um, and this is the result. <clears throat> you can see the sand and the shell being thrown up um, on, onto the beach. And if you look at this particular one here, you can see the old marsh out here, which the ocean is eroding away, and the sand and the shells being thrown up back here. And here on the backside, you can see it basically clearly marching its way landward as the waves keep washing it over. So this is, this is how a chenier forms. <laughs> uh, it's actually operating right now as we speak. So this is what people came to live on. Uh, once they formed, and you started getting vegetation on them and plants and animals moved in there, suddenly they became good places for people to live. <coughs> and so, obviously when people came to the chenilles depends on when a particular chenille became established. So the oldest sites are probably back, you know, further back here on Little Chenier and uh, Little Pecan Island, but the people who came there probably were coming out of the Mississippi River Valley in this area and slowly making their way this way. Um, why? You know, probably they're just exploring new territories, looking for new hunting grounds, new places to live. Um, but the artifacts we find with people suggest that this is where they're coming from. They share a lot of similarities with people, our sites and people that we see in here. When you get down to actually talking about which sites have mounds on the Chenier Plain, there are actually eight that we know of. There might have been more, um, but they disappeared before archaeologists could get around to recording them. There are actually six sites with mounds down here on uh, Pecan Island, which is where we're going to talk about. But I want to at least mention there were two mounds up here on Little Pecan Island, and over here on Little Chenier, uh, there were four, maybe five. Um, but if you take all of these mound sites together, there were somewhere around 21 or 22 Indian mounds on the Cheniers before Europeans got here. Today, well, the last time I went down there to look, it's been 15 or 18 years, there are only six and a half that still remain today. And I'm not even sure all of those still are present. Um, <clears throat> all right, so oh, let me back up just a second. So this dot right here, this is Morgan that we're going to talk about, but I'm going to mention this site here just briefly. Uh, this is the Vise Mound Group, and in 1926, the first archaeologist to come to this part of Louisiana, Henry Collins, he worked for the U.S. National Museum, made this sketch map. Believe it or not, there were 14, well, somewhere between 11 and 14 mounds at that particular site in 1926. The only ones that I know still exist today are this one and half of this one, um, only because they're far enough back into the woods and the marsh that nobody's cleared the land for agriculture. All the rest of them are gone. But Henry Collins dug probably in this mound. Um, his notes aren't very good. 
But he picked it because there were lots of human bones being exposed as these mounds were being plowed for agriculture. Um, <clears throat> and some of the artifacts he found give us a pretty good idea of when that particular mound, or at least when some of these mounds were built. These are what are known as ear spools. Um, they're basically, they're sandstone or, or silicified siltstone that's been ground uh, flat on one side, then there's a little column, and then you have sort of like a tripartite design on the other. And if you've ever seen some pictures of some native groups, particularly in Africa, where they put large things through the lobes of their ear, you, you know, if you work on it, you can get a very large hole. And it's, these are probably more symbolic ear things. They may have been suspended or whatever. Um, but where you find these is in Ohio um, from 2,000 years ago. This is a piece of copper that may very well have fit over one of these. Uh, it's not clear. But you then have a couple of uh, bear canines, one of them drilled as a pendant. And these are actually made out of shell, but they're probably intended to be imitation bear canines. And so these artifacts tell us that at least that mound at the Vise site was built probably 2,000 years ago, uh, at a time that archaeologists know in the Midwest, we call it the Hopewell period, if you've ever heard about some of the big Ohio Hopewell sites, Mound City um, and whatnot. Um, they, they were really big in the ceremonialism and burying people with lots of fancy goodies and whatnot. And these artifacts, honestly, you could take and lose in Ohio. In fact, that's probably where they were made and came down to Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> so, at least on Pecan Island, there were people living there at least 2,000 years ago building mounds. It was a sensitive touch. All right, now to Morgan. So the first, this is the site um, that was mapped in 1979. There were three mounds then. There was originally a fourth, which was right here. Uh, that mound disappeared in 1953 when LA-82 was built. Um, I'm sure they used it for road fill. Um, today, the only one that's left is Mound 3. And here's a recent Google Earth street view image. You can see the mound. You drive right past it on the highway. You can't miss it if you know what to look for. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, as I said, Henry Collins was at Vise in 1926, but he also came and spent four and a half days here at Morgan. He was the first archaeologist to dig at Morgan. Unfortunately, his notes aren't nearly as good as one would like them to be. But he excavated at least a little bit into Mound 1, but most of his time was spent excavating into Mound 2 and into Mound 3. Um, <clears throat> I'll show you in just a second, but it looks like these two mounds were probably built in much the same way, and we'll go into what mound one looks like here in just a second. Um, but there's an interesting difference between them in that this mound had a lot of burials, human burials associated with it. He doesn't say how many, but he found them on several sides um, of the mound around the flat top here. And he also found quite a few burials here in mound three. Apparently none of them had artifacts with them, um, or at least he doesn't mention that. Um, <coughs> these are some of the artifacts that he found, although he doesn't tell us where he got them. Um, but this is his profile from Mound 2, and I put this up here so you can remember this when we talk about Mound 1, because they look like they're almost identical. So you have a big mound here that's built out of sand and shell hash, and then you have, which probably the living surface where structures were, um, and then that was capped over, and then you have the, basically the topsoil that formed, um, you know, later. Um, then in 1979, Ian Brown, who was then uh, with Harvard University, came to the site for the field school. Um, they were helped along by a group of high school students in an advanced class out of Lafayette. Um, and they did a series of small unit excavations uh, here, mostly you know, off the mound. 
um, but they did two larger unit excavations here. And these, this excavation is important because what it does is it gives us a sample of the people living in the village. Not, the, not what was happening on the mounds, but what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis uh, around the mounds where everybody would have been living. And we'll talk about those differences in a second. So, everybody knows, I suspect, what happened in 1986. Uh, the landowner uh, got into some serious financial difficulty through no fault of his own, um, but he was in severe danger of the bank foreclosing on his property and losing everything. And the only way he could see to raise money was to sell the mounds for Phil. It would have given him enough money to pay off uh, his bank note. Um, but he knew archeologists were interested in the property because Ian had been there just six years before. Um, so he actually contacted archaeologists and offered the local people, I mean, contact was made with people who were associated with the historical society at the time, um, and basically said, if you can come up with the money, you can have the mound. Things did not work out to save Mound 2. Um, he ended up selling that, um, and it was taken down with heavy equipment. The only thing that came out of it that we know of is the effigy that's up here on display. And an individual found that in a truckload of fill in his driveway. It survived excavation, transport in a dump truck, and then spreading uh, in a driveway. And when you take a look at it, it's amazing that it survived the way it did. But it is one of the most fantastic artifacts you'll see from this part of Louisiana. <coughs> but, People were able to get together. Uh, the Vermilion Historical Society raised a bunch of money. The National Geographic Society contributed some money and the state of Louisiana contributed some money. And that was enough to hire a crew of four people to come down for six weeks and excavate as best they could Mound One here. And so the rest of this talk is about what they found. Oops, sorry. That's what the mound looked like in 1986 when they came down here to start working. <clears throat> because they had a very small crew um, and limited amount of time, they couldn't excavate the entire mound. So they focused on doing first a series of trenches, north, south, and east, west through the mound to get an idea of how it was put together. Um, and then they excavated essentially the north half of the mound up here. And here you can see the mound. There's one of the trenches being excavated through it. And we just have some photographs showing how they dug. This is some of these 10 by 10 foot blocks. And here are some other photographs showing the crew at work. <clears throat> so before the mound was ever built, People were living here. There had been a village here since probably about 800 AD, uh, somewhere 800, 850 AD. We don't know exactly when they moved in, um, but they were living where the mound was later built. Um, and we can see that because this is the ground surface underneath the north half of the mound. And all of these little black dots here represent post holes where posts were in the ground. So you're probably looking at the remains of structures, places where people lived, or it could have been, you know, racks for drying fish or other things that needed to, to have a, a structure. And there were also a series of pits, uh, which were excavations into the ground, perhaps used for storing food or throwing away your trash or whatever. Um, so in the beginning, where Mound was, was actually part of the village site. This is a schematic, just to give you a sense of how the mound was built. So here's the village site underneath. And any of you as kids who ever played on a beach in the sand or perhaps in your, your sandbox growing up, you know if you try to make a pile out of sand, you can only get it so high before it starts sloughing off the side and rolling down and you can't build it up no matter what you do. Well, the people who were in Morgan knew dirt and sediments as well as we did. And so what you have, as anybody who's been down the Chenier's know, they're built out of sand and shell hash, ground up shell. It's not very stable. Um, 
So they actually built a little donut on the ground represented by this, made out of a stiffer, sandier, clayier dirt. Um, and you can see that here in the profile. Here's that ridge they built, and here you can see the individual basket loads when they started filling, building the mound on the inside. Here's the same thing here. You can see that hump, and then the basket loads of dirt lying here. So what this does, basically think of it as a donut on the ground circular donut built to the size that you want the mound to be. And then you start piling up the sand and the shell hash on the inside of that. And what that ring does is it gives a foundation that doesn't allow it to slump down. And so that way you can build the mound to the height that you want. So the mound was then built. Um, and at some point they flattened it. The, they stopped and made a flat top here. Um, put a little bit of a clay cap over it, and then there's a series of occupations on top. And I'll show you a map of that in a second. So they built a series of structures on top, had a bunch of activities, and then at some point they were done with the mound. And they basically covered it up with one last layer and basically said, okay, we're done. Um, this is what the top of the mound looked like. So you had a flat area about a little over 30, 35 feet in diameter. And you can see it's just full of post holes. Um, it's hard to pick out individual structures, but probably there were multiple circular structures to about 30 feet in diameter uh, that were built here. Um, this is a central hearth. Um, this pit here is probably the one that Henry Collins dug in 1926. Um, but one of the ways we know there were multiple structures is A, there are lots of post holes, but B, there are four or five hearths, fireplaces stacked one on top of one another, each one probably going with a separate structure. So when they were done with one structure, they basically pulled up the post, completely rebuilt it, made a new central fireplace, used it for whatever period of time, uh, and then repeated the process over and over again. And so here's one of these central fireplaces that you can see has been excavated here. This is what it looks like in, in real color here. And you can see the individual post holes scattered all across the surface. <clears throat> While they were doing activities, it's not clear whether certain members of the community were actually living on top of the mound. I mean, was this their home? Or was it a place more akin to a religious, you know, like a church or community center where community activities, religious activities, sacred activities were carried out? It's a little hard to tell the difference um, from an archaeological perspective. But what's interesting for us is that while they were living up here on the mound, the materials they were using, the artifacts, that, the pots they were using and breaking, and the animal bones that they were from the foods they were eating, they were basically tossing it down the side of the mound. And so this dark layer here basically represents the garbage from the people who were living up on top. And so what this does is this means we can compare what kinds of artifacts they're using on top of the mound as opposed to what the people in the village were using. And there are some very interesting differences. <clears throat> in the village area, the vast majority of the pottery is plain. It's not decorated. And, what it, and if it is decorated, it's with this particular style here. This is a, what we call punch or drain check stamp. But imagine taking a wooden paddle, probably three or four inches in size, and, base, and carving grooves into it so that when you slap it up against wet clay, it leaves that waffle pattern on there. And so this is, this is the check stamp. And so they would take that paddle and basically go all the way around the vessel and create that textured decorated look. But in the village area, this is about the only kind of decoration you see. That is not what you see when you look at the mount. You see uh, this check stamp pottery, but very unique designs. 
And we have a couple of examples of both of these kinds of pottery here you can come up and look at after. And one of the things that's interesting about these designs is you almost never see them anywhere else but Morgan. This seems to be something specific to Morgan. You know, a particular artist created it. You know, it was popular for the hundred years they were there or whatever, but it didn't expand much outside uh, of that site. Come on. There we go. They painted a lot of the pots, the people who were on the mound. Um, primarily with red colors, um, but also white. Um, and there are even a few painted with uh, brown and black colors. Not a lot, but some. Um, and this is this kind of intense painting of pots is not something that you often see a lot of in sites of this time period. It's much more frequent here in the mound than you might find at a lot of other places. There are complicated stamps here. So I told you about the paddle for Pontchartrain where they just cut cross grooves in it. These here, they're doing very complicated stamps. They're creating, carving very complicated patterns into a piece of wood. Um, you can see here, uh, here's one that's got circular parts, and then they're stamping that across the pot. Um, this is, there are not very many of these shirts that have been found in Louisiana. Some archaeologists did a study, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, and they only came up with about 40 or 50, and half of them are from Morgan. Um, and we're going to talk a bit more about what the meaning of these is in a minute. Oops, sorry. Um, and then there are the things that make archaeologists pull their hair out. You will see when you come up here, we give names to the various kinds of decorations. That's how we talk to one another. I can say, oh, I found a Pontchartrain check stamp at this site, and they have a mental image of what it is I'm talking about. <coughs> what we don't know how to deal with is when the original makers start messing with us and putting multiple <laughs> kinds of decorations on one pot because this does not fit our ability to classify things into simple patterns. So this is a, you can see there's a nice check stamp design on the body, but the neck here has what we would refer to as a Mexican sized variety brulee decoration. Um, on this one, they reverse the pattern. They put the check stamping up here on the rim, but then the bottom is, again, it's a Mexican sized different variety. Um, and it really throws archaeologists out of whack because we have no idea what we're supposed to call these or how you <laughs> describe them to people. Um, the only whole vessel was found, that was found was this tiny little bowl. And you can see this is a centimeter scale here. You're talking about something that's only about two or three inches in diameter. So it's probably a drinking glass. You can think of it as a small shot glass. Um, or it's the child's, you know, bowl. There was very nice preservation on the mound, uh, and so we got a lot of animal bone, um, including some really nice examples of bone tools, uh, and we have several of these on exhibit here for you to come look at. Um, these are bone projectile points. Um, you can see they're hollow here, so they would have been socketed on the end of a cane to use for hunting. Um, we've got needles or awls used for making basketry or clothing. This is a very interesting piece. This is broken, but this is a piece of bone that's obviously been carved into some kind of design and has a hole on it that was probably used as suspended around the neck. So it is some kind of decorative piece, a piece of jewelry or something like that. Um, and then this is something that you probably will not ever see again because I've never seen one in 50 years. This is actually a projectile point that has been chipped out of, an, out of bone. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody doing that before. We actually we have it up here for you to look at. Um, so, doctor, doctor, yes. behind you, right here. So, when you say that most projectile points are made out of stone, is that what you're implying? If you're going to chip them, yes. So, think of maybe you might have actually seen a video or somebody of somebody flint napping and making a stone projectile point. But it, the way to think of it is they're basically whittling the stone down into a shape that they want. 
So instead of taking a knife and cutting pieces off, you're using a hammer stone to knock pieces off. But if you're experienced and you know what you're doing, you can guide that hammer to take the pieces off in the way that you want. And so you can create, within certain limits, um, the tools that you need. I've never heard of anybody flaking bone <laughs> to make a projectile point. Um, but these are examples of the kinds of stone projectile points that were found. Uh, these are very typical for 900 to 1000 AD. These are true arrow points. So these were the people would have been using the bow and arrow at that time. Um, there's a polished stone rock here that we have no idea what it was used for. Um, and then they actually also found a couple of shell beads, uh, which are very tiny. We have one of them up here uh, on display. All right, what does all this mean? So, as I said before, people almost certainly started coming onto the chenilles as soon as they were formed and vegetation had, had taken over and there was, you know, some way you could, you know, get timber for fuel and building houses and you know you could hunt for squirrels and muskrats and whatnot um, and so over time people would have occupied the first chenilles and then sort of moved their way um, geologists tend to think that this particular chenille here the grand chenille ridge with pecan island formed somewhere around 15 to 1800 years ago um, that's actually contradicted a bit by the artifacts we found from Vise, which could easily be at least 2,000 years old. So there's still a little bit of uncertainty there. Um, but sometime around probably 700 AD, there were people that came out of the lower Mississippi River Valley and moved out onto the Chenier Plain, and they built at least a series of mounds down here um, and built these two sets up here. One of the things that's interesting is, as far as we can tell at this point, little chenier here, right here, is as far west as they went. You did not find Coles Creek period artifacts west of there. What you get are things that are much more familiar with what you would see in southeast Texas. And so that seems to be sort of like a cultural boundary around 700-800 AD. Um, but it certainly seems clear that the primary Coles Creek occupation was down here um, on Little Pecan Island. <coughs> Let's see, where am I going with this? Um, so, in thinking about what Morgan specifically tells us, we know that there was a large community living around the mounds and even under, in the area where some mounds were later built probably starting around 800, 850 AD. Um, and then at some point, they started building the mounds. We believe that at least mound one, based on the kinds of artifacts and the radiocarbon dates we're seeing, was probably built and used sometime 925 to 1000 AD, thereabouts. Um, and Probably that's going to be true for the other mounds, although we don't really have any good evidence one way or the other. Um, but sometime after 1000 AD, it appears that almost all of these sites were abandoned. And it's hard to tell if people actually left or if, if they stayed, they stopped doing all of this kind of stuff. Because uh, there were certainly people living down here you know, after this time. They just weren't building mounds and making fancy pottery and doing all of this really cool stuff. Um, so I mentioned that we had samples from the village area, and I've talked about the differences in the pottery, where you have really nice, lots of really nice fine pottery, decorated pottery, lots of it. It's mostly bowls, the kinds of things you would serve food in or you would eat food in. Uh, whereas out here in the village, you've got lots of plain pots. They tend to be larger jars like you would use for cooking and storing food. Very few of them are decorated. So there's clearly some differentiation between what goes on on the mound and what goes on in the village area. Um, at the same time, if you look at the animal remains that are found out here in the village area, it's almost entirely fish and turtle. This is what people are living on, on the chenilles, is fishes and turtles. Um, but 
if you look at what's found on the slopes of the mound that was being tossed, tossed down the side from the people living up here, there's a whole lot more red meat. This is where the deer, the muskrat, the raccoon are being consumed. So there are two possible interpretations for this. One is that you basically have the community social elite, which is living up on top of the mounds. They have the nice china, they get the best food, you know, they're living high and dry. Um, and, you know, the common folk are living in the village down below. The other alternative is that basically everybody is more or less equal and lives down here in the village. And the mountaintops are being used for social, ceremonial, political, religious activities, which is where you would expect to find a nicer artifacts being used. You know, think of the nice things that occur in churches. You don't bring in your common garden variety, you know, plastic dinner, dinnerware from Walmart. Um, and you would expect if you're having a community feast or something of religious significance that you're going to make special foods for it. And so either of those possibilities could be what's happening here. You either have a social elite on the mound or you have it being used as a, as a ceremonial community sacred space. It's really hard to tell the difference from an archaeological perspective. <clears throat> now I mentioned that we're going to come back to those complicated stamp shirts. So <clears throat> through for most of Louisiana's prehistory, before Europeans got here, what we tend to see is that most people seem to be basically exchanging ideas and artifacts up and down the Mississippi River Valley. I talked about the Vise site and the artifacts there, which are identical to what you could find in Ohio. Um, there are a couple other sites in Louisiana that belong to that same time period. Um, and as I say, throughout most of Louisiana's past, it seems most of the exchange and interaction and movement of peoples is, tends to be north to south. But around 500 AD, that seems to change along the coast. And archaeologists have for a long time commented that when you get to six or 700 AD, the artifacts down here in this part of the world look very different than the contemporary ones from up here. The people on the coast are moving off and doing sort of their own thing. And one of the things that Morgan tells us is that it's over here, but those complicated stamp shirts and some of the other decorated varieties you can find all the way over here in Tampa, Florida, a thousand miles away. And so Morgan is one of those early instances where it looks like after about 500 AD, there's a lot more movement of people east-west along the Gulf Coast and not north-south up and down the Mississippi River Valley. And this is something that we actually see a little bit later in time. After 1000 AD, we actually see people coming out of the Pensacola Mobile Bay area, moving into southeast Louisiana around Lake Pontchartrain. And some of the sites we've looked at basically look like whole communities just got up and moved, came to Louisiana, still making the same kinds of pottery that they were making back home. And it looks very different than anything that the local people were doing. Um, and then finally, once Europeans arrived and were concentrated mostly along the East Coast, as many people know, a lot of the native tribes were forced westward. Um, and so you had a lot of immigrants, refugees, moving into Louisiana from places to the East. And it, what appears is that that was probably a well-known path by then because people have been moving east and west for over a thousand years by that time. So the people that came to Louisiana as refugees were actually traveling a well-known and well-trod path. It wasn't something new and different for them. And with that, I'll shut up and I will be available for answering questions. Um, I don't know if Carla wants to say anything, but we did bring some artifacts for you all to see. Um, there are posters up here on the table, which illustrate all the periods of uh, the past in Louisiana's history. Um, and I see hand up for questions. Could you talk about the deer and their ornament, the carved thing? The 
uh, yeah, if I knew anything about it, I would. Um, <laughs> There's information on their website about it, about how it was found, and a little bit about how it was basically carved. Basically, as much as we can tell, being that it was found elsewhere, it's kind of hard to say what its use was or what it was with. But they have a whole series of pages that have several photos of them on the, their historical sites website. It is their artifact. That does not belong to us. That's fully theirs. So um, um, any questions about it are probably more better yeah. directed for them. It's, it's, um, it's on our website. And it's uh, what we do know is that it's carved out of deer antler. Um, we have the original and a replica. And good luck figuring out which one is the real one we know. Um, <laughs> And there's been some speculation based on the, the carving and the showing of teeth, and you're the archaeologist, I'm not, that it might have been an image of a deceased Native American Indian. Uh, but Yeah, I suspect your question was more aimed as what does it mean and what did it mean to them? And the answer is we don't have any idea. Um, archaeologists generally fall back on the sacred ceremonial when we have no better explanation for anything. Um, but I think in this case that probably really applies. This was almost certainly an object um, not of casual, you know, everyday use. This would have been a community object that either may have represented a particular individual, but probably more likely was a spiritual representation um, of some mythical being. Um, you know, much like we put up, you know, Jesus on the cross. He's not actually there, but this is a reputation of him, a representation of him that people can look at and admire and you know pay homage to. Something like this probably served a similar function for people back then. It was an image of some spiritual entity that had meaning to them. Yes, ma'am. What do we know about people? Um, are they identified as a particular group or a name? Are they genetically identified? Well, no. <laughs> Uh, simply put, um, Henry Collins excavated most of the skeletons from the site, and he did not keep any of the bones. Uh, in fact, um, there were three human burials found when they excavated the north part of Mound One. Um, unfortunately, they found them in very fragmented condition, and so we don't know a whole lot about them. Um, no DNA has been done. Um, I mean, as a general rule, you can say most Native Americans at that time period um, tended to be relative, somewhat shorter uh, than our average people today. Um, men tended to be around 5'6 or 5'7, women around 5'3 to 5'5. Um, you know, health was entirely dependent on, you know, how well you ate. Um, these people here probably were actually probably relatively healthy. Um, because eating fish is a very good thing for you, as modern doctors will tell you today. Um, eat less red meat and a lot more fish and turtle, and it's better for you. <laughs> um, but other than that, you know, we really can't say, you know, where people came from, um, or even necessarily, you know, what, how they would have looked, um, because bone down here doesn't preserve very well. Mr. Morrissey, you have a question? Oh, sorry. I kind of want to thank you. I'd like you to look at it exactly like what you told me. All right. I, yeah, bring it over when we're done, and I'll be happy to look at it. Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Close proximity to the alligator mouth. Yeah. Is that something that would have been found here in Brumhouseville? He was selected an artifact from it. Right. Yes. Right, yes. Um, there used to be a whole lot of shell piles down here, as there were throughout the, the basin. Um, and some of them were impressive. There were ones south of New Orleans, which stretched for a half mile long along a bayou, and in some cases were 40 to 50 feet high. I mean, people were eating the little brackish water clam, the Rangia clam, by the billions, um, and then discarding them. and. There were two things. One, they were getting the food, but if you discard them around, you basically build yourself up, and so you create a nice dry spot to come back to next year to live on. Um, 
you know, whether the alligator man was truly an effigy or not has always been a subject of great debate amongst archaeologists. And as he mentioned, unfortunately, it got destroyed before anybody could actually get any very good measurements of it or not. I am personally a little skeptical that it actually was an effigy, only because there are no other effigy mounds in Louisiana. Um, my guess is that it was basically an occasional accumulation, which somebody said, oh, oh, that looks like an alligator, but I'm not sure it was actually intended to be that. But it's one of those things we'll never know. Well, what? Yes, sir. No, it came from the Great Lakes. Yeah, that, that copper piece, um, and there have been a couple of other fragments found. Those, that came from uh, the Great Lakes area, uh, the upper Midwest, uh, where you can actually, in the old days, you used to be able to pick up gravel, um, or pick up copper nuggets uh, eroding out of streams and whatnot. Um, so it's part of that example that trade was going up and down the Mississippi River earlier than 2,000 years ago as opposed to east-west at a later time. Where was the alligator mile? Um, <laughs> near the fall. Southeast corner of Grand Lake. Um, yeah. It's in this neighborhood, was, somewhere go, in here. Go north. Um, well, there's a whole series of shell middens all around White Lake and Grand Lake. The alligator uh, effigy man was on our family property. Oh, was it? The southeast corner. We, oh, still, yeah. we still own the property. Down here? No, in Grand Lake. Oh, Grand Lake. Up right there. there yeah, about okay. right there. Yeah, it's been a while since I've paid attention to that. Um, so, yeah, I'd give a lot for it to still be there. Um, if any of you are, are interested, back in the 1930s, I think, the fellow who was at that time the newspaper editor here in Abbeville wrote an article. Um, if you email me, I can uh, find it and send you a copy of it. Uh, we printed it some time ago. But he talks about taking a boat ride um, out uh, to Grand Lake where they were mining shell because um, there was a big shell pile there, it was 40 or 50 feet high. And basically what he talks about is seeing literally hundreds of bodies being scooped up in the shell. And so as you walk the streets of Abbeville, <laughs> you are walking on top of dead people. <laughs> um, that's what lines, they were out there mining the shell to build the streets and sidewalks of, of Abbeville back in the 30s. Um, and that's a very common story. The streets of New Orleans, Morgan City, New Iberia, all of those, the early roads and streets are paved with shell taken from shell mounds, and they all have artifacts and they all have human remains in them. That's good. So, yes, sir. I found an arrowhead or a spearhead recently uh, in Abbeville. So there's, there's almost no way to tell if that was some of the from from here that it was brought in and, and got in somebody's drive or something? It would depend a lot on where you found it. Um, so, but I have actually seen artifacts show up in gravel <laughs> that people are spreading in their driveways. Um, it makes you wonder where they're getting stuff. Um, but, you know, if I had a chance to look at it, you know, I could probably tell you, A, how old it is, and by looking at the raw material, I could tell you, you know, where that material was gotten from, because, as you know, there ain't no rock down here. Um, the nearest rock, you know, is, is up north in Evangela and Jeff Davis and, you know, places farther north. But even then, you don't get rock that's much bigger than about this. Uh, if you get larger points, that came from somewhere out in the state. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mr. Marzi. Oh. Yeah, Mr. Marzi. Are there legal protections now that would stop a landowner from turning these archaeological sites into driveway fill? Not an archaeological site per se. Um, the only protection is you're not allowed to destroy cemeteries. There are several number of state laws that pertain to cemeteries, and the laws are very clear. It does not matter how old they are, what ethnicity, age, race, whatever. 
you cannot disturb a cemetery. So these mounds that might still have burials in them, that doesn't stop the landowner from digging into them, but as soon as they hit burials, they are expected to stop. And then they come talk to me. <laughs> I mean, you, you can move a cemetery. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing in, in the law that says you can't disinter everybody and rebury them somewhere else. It's expensive, very expensive, and very time consuming. I don't recommend it, but you can if you want. Yes, sir. Um, not publicly available. Um, I mean, as the Division of Archaeology, one of our charges is to keep a record of all the archaeological sites that have been recorded in the state. Right now we have around 22,000 um, statewide, about 700 of which have mounds. Um, but we don't generally make that information public because unfortunately there are still too many people who would go dig into them to find artifacts and would be more interested in destroying them and taking things to sell on the market than they would be in preserving them uh, for the past. And so we do not generally, unless there's a specific reason for somebody to know, we don't generally show people where they are. Why would they call the back of and where that name came from? Um, so, I don't remember exactly which language the Takapa comes out of. The stories are that it means uh, basically man-eater or cannibal. Um, however, and there is, in, in the historic accounts, there is one story that, in fact, a group of people that were called by the recorder, the Spanish who recorded this, as a Takapa, where they actually did dismember a captive and eat him. It was a ritual thing. It was not done for me, and it wasn't done for me. The idea was that if you ate part of your enemy, you took his spirit, his energy, and his soul into you and made it part of you. You took the good parts, you know, and added it to you. And so, as I say, it was not butchering for meat to feed everybody. This was a very ritualized, you know, special thing. So I think it's a mistake to re really re think of them as cannibals. Um, most people probably never ever experienced it. Um, I don't recall you mentioning the attack of paws. Or, I mean, there's no uh, clarity there about whether that's who was creating no, these. Um, we cannot identify tribes uh, before Europeans arrived, because all we have are the artifacts. Um, and unfortunately, most of the artifact designs that I showed you here, or if you find at any of these sites, are found across hundreds of miles. Um, there are some artifact styles that you can find all the way from the Gulf Coast up into southern Arkansas or even the western Mississippi. You know, and just because people are making the same style of pot doesn't mean they're part of the same culture. You only need to look at us. If you look in your house, and see where your ceramics are made. It's going to say made in Indonesia, made in Germany, made in South Korea. And I don't think any of you are going to claim to be from those places. <laughs> um, so, you know, until Europeans get here and start assigning names to groups, and many of the names that tribes call themselves now are, in fact, the name that was given to them by Europeans who were basically trying to figure out from the, their interpreter this is the word the interpreter said, this is what the Spanish or the Frenchman heard and what he wrote down, which may not be at all what the people actually themselves call themselves, but it's what we come to know them today. So for the Atacapa, there are so few records. They were the group that was living in the coast between essentially Bayou Tesh and the Sabine and over into Southeast Texas. Um, but even in, the early 1800s, there were only three or four known villages. There were not very many of them left. Yes. Can you give us an idea on the Morgan Mound uh, artifacts in the surrounding area of how important or special they are in this in this broad scope of North American Indian artifacts? Are they are they very significant? Or are they are par for the course? Or? Um. 
Well, the answer is from an archaeological perspective, the collection is actually very significant. And a large part of that is because Morgan is one of the very few sites that we've actually been able to excavate. Um, most mounds got, have been destroyed before we ever see them. You know, as I talked about, there used to be 21 plus on the Chenier's. Now there may be six. Um, so we'll never know what was in the other mounds or how they were built or how they were being used or whether or not they were being used as cemeteries, you know, or as platforms for structures. Um, and so this is true for a lot of significant sites, you know, is we get little glimpses here and there rather than being able to go look at all the sites and see what, you know, the totality of the population was doing, we're left with just this little window and so those sites become extremely important because it's the only window we're going to get. Uh, and so that's the value of Morgan, um, both uh, in terms of what it tells us, but also in preserving that information for the future because it's our only look at that part of the past and this part of Louisiana. Yes, sir. Um, well, mounds are discovered like anything else. People wander around, they see something. Um, you know, as soon as Europeans came to North America, they saw these edifices. I mean, there's a famous story. Thomas Jefferson actually excavated, was thought to be the first archaeologist. He dug the first mound on his plantation in Virginia and actually left some pretty good notes about it. Um, <clears throat> So people have been poking into these mounds for a long time. Um, I can tell you from my own personal experience of the last four or five years that there are a lot of mounds that we still do not know about. Um, I have some folks that I know who love to play with LIDAR. If any of you know what LIDAR is, there are publicly available LIDAR data sets you can go look at. Basically, it gives you a three-dimensional view of the surface of Louisiana. And you can just run around and look for little bumps on the landscape. Um, and they have, one fellow I know, Glenn Carlson, has pointed out to me probably 20 or 25 places up in northeast Louisiana that I'm absolutely certain are Indian mounds that we've never seen before. Um, so, yes, they are still out there. Yes, sir. You spoke about the history of these people living and building these mound around 800 AD. At what point did they leave, why they left, and where did they go? Do we have any knowledge of that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Hurricanes or? Um, you know, many years ago I read, he, he asked if they left because of hurricanes. And I'll, tell you a little story. I read actually in a Vermilion Parish history that somebody had written back in the 30s or 40s. Um, and they told the story um, of a family that was living on one of the Chenier's, Grand Chenier, I think, um, in the 1800s. And they had supposedly an old Indian working for them. And he came to them one day and said, we have to leave now. There's a big storm coming. You know, and back in the 1800s, the only way you could get out was to get in your piro and, and paddle till you got to dry land, you know, 20 or 30 miles north. So it wasn't a simple thing to do. Um, and he kept insisting they have to leave. And, you know, they looked up at some blue sky and clouds floating around. It was like, the crazy old Indian, what the hell does he know? Um, two days later, they knew what he was talking about. At which point he told them, okay, the only thing you can do is climb up in a live oak and tie yourself in. And they had a wooden frame house and thought, that's crazy, we're just gonna hunker down in a house and wait this out. The reason we know the story is because he lived and they didn't. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the reason I tell that story is to address the point Eric made, is that we today don't know how to read nature. There are a lot of subtle clues that people who spend their lifetime out there and have to be able to read what the birds are doing, what the animals are doing, subtle changes in pressure and temperature and wind. These people spent their lifetimes living outdoors, having to know that in order to survive. And so they recognized when a storm was coming long before we ever would. 
if we didn't have satellites. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as we know from like the Galveston hurricane and whatnot, where there was no warning, then hundreds of people died. Um, so, you know, I think part of the answer to your question is no, we're not ever going to know why people left. Um, if you look at the big patterns of human history, I mean, this is actually pretty normal. People move into an area, they live for a while, they build a particular culture, and then it changes, you know, and sometimes it changes into something which is not nearly as spectacular. They may not have gone anywhere. They just stopped building mounds and making fancy pottery, but they continue to live there. Um, we simply don't know that. Um, but whatever it was, that whole idea of building mounds and having all that ceremonialism became passe. How many years did they did they stay here? How, how long do we think were they here? Best guess is they started living here somewhere probably in the early 800 AD, and by 1000 AD it appears that they were gone. <clears throat> Not long. Yes, ma'am. Is there an community Yes. Not farming, uh, there's little evidence that people were intentionally growing crops. Um, but you have to understand that, you know, things like seeds and leaves and berries and nuts and whatnot don't preserve very well. They don't preserve at all. You know, bone preserves in the right conditions. So when we try to figure out what people are actually eating, we're very limited in what we can tell. We know from historic accounts that for most tribal communities in the eastern half of the U.S., plant food made up 70, 80% of what people ate day in and day out. Meat was a luxury most of the time, <laughs> um, and often saved for ceremonial occasions. So while people were not agriculturalists, and that there's no evidence here that people were growing corn or squash or beans or any of the things that we think of, or even that they were necessarily planting some of the local seeds and intentionally harvesting, they certainly were making use of all the green things out there. Um, and that's what they really subsisted on. Yes, sir. I'd share with you the Lee Parish story. About 20 years ago, I spent this evening, afternoon with Ivy Reshore. And as a young man, he ran the mailboat every week mm -hmm. from Shell Morgan Landing to Pecone House. Yes. And he talked about a lady who had learned the Indian language and during the fall and winter, she'd be buying traps and pots and pans for the Indians. Mm. And, and this was in the 30s. And, and according to him, the Indians came with the geese. And when the geese left, they left. And I said, well, where did they go? Well, they said they were going back to the mountains. Yep. Wow. Yeah, back there's where? actually uh, where? some historic accounts that say, uh, in, at least in the 16 and 1700s, people would spend the winter time up along the Mermintau, the Calcasieu, you know, because you have the oak forest, that's where the deer, the turkey, the squirrels are going to be. And then in the summertime, you would come down to the coast and live because you can get the fish um, and other birds and whatnot. And so they had this sort of seasonal migration. Um, at least for the folks at Morgan, it doesn't look like that's probably the case. It appears that they're putting enough effort in this. They're probably staying year round. But after that time, they may have adopted more of this movement across the landscape um, just to take advantage of the resources that were out there. Just yes, one thing, I, I had a question about it, and, I, and you might have covered it, and I missed it. When you started to describe the donut shape of the beginning of a mound, I always was under the impression that a mound was more of a burial ground, but in your description, it is not. It is a, why are they going up? Any answer to that? Um, other than wild speculation, no. <laughs> um, so, the, Sort of two questions, I'll, I'll, two answers I'll give to your question. 
One is, if you look at mounds across Louisiana or even the southeastern U.S. in general, most of them are not burial mounds. The vast majority of mounds do not have people buried in them. Um, there are certainly some mounds that do, and obviously there was at least a couple of mounds of Vise that had human remains, and the mounds at Morgan, three of them had at least some burials uh, in them. Um, but in terms of why you build a mound, I mean, I could stand here and give you a graduate seminar for, you know, the next 40 nights, and we still wouldn't answer that question. Um, but mounds they're basically can basically all alike. They basically start with that donut shape. No, donut that's shape. really only on the coast because it's a reflection of the material they have to use in order to build up a pile of sand high enough to get with them, get as high as they wanted. You have to keep it from sliding down, and so that's what the donut was for. It basically yeah. was a wall at the bottom to hold the sand and shell in place, um, and. I mean, a lot of mounds don't have a flat top where people lived. They simply built the mound as a marker on the landscape for whatever purpose. Um, mounds, as I say, we can speculate all for a long time about what they mean. They are, among other things, they are markers on the landscape. There are certain parts of the U.S. where we're pretty clear that they represent territorial markers. <coughs> They're basically putting them up saying, if you come down this river valley and you see the mound on the bluff over here, you know that this is somebody's territory. Um, <clears throat> or they may have been used to actually sort of set out territories. Each group, each community had its own mound and sort of defined the space in which they lived. Um, mounds can also, is summer mounds are built specifically to be places to bury the dead. Some are clearly built as places where you hold ceremonies and community activities and whatnot. Um, a lot of times if you have sites that have multiple mounds, they're arranged in such a way that if you stand on one and you look across to the other, you're looking at a particular celestial event like the equinox or the solstice or the quarter moon rise or something like that. So they're using them in effect as calendars. Um, <coughs> But when you get right down to it, why somebody would go to all that trouble is, you know, it's part of the mystery of being human. Yes, sir. Are there any comparable size mounds yeah, like that's Poverty Point in Louisiana? There is nothing like Mound A at Poverty Point. In fact, it is the second or third largest mound in all of Eastern North America. Um, the only one that's clearly bigger is Monk's Mound at Cahokia, uh, outside of East St. Louis. Um, hmm? How big are they? How large are they? Um, there, there was a big mound at Troyville, um, which unfortunately most, well, it disappeared over a period of time, but most of it disappeared in the 30s when they needed fill to build a bridge over the Black River. Um, <clears throat> it was thought to be 80 feet tall um, the one that Troy built, Poverty Point's about 90 feet tall um, and what, 400 by 600 feet in size. Um, so. But the width, how wide are they? Um, so the one at Poverty Point, as I say, I think is about 600 feet long and about 400 feet at its maximum width. The one at Troyville was somewhere in the 400 to 500 feet uh, dimensions. It tended to be more square. Um, the, the one at, at Cahokia, the mount, the, what's called Monk's Mound, actually covers about five acres of ground at its base. I mean, it is just a huge monstrosity. Um, <coughs> yes, sir. story goes that a long time ago, they had a, a I don't, I've not heard that story here. There are other instances in the U.S. history where, yes, clothes or blankets that had been used by people who later died of smallpox were given to the Indians, free of charge, of course, um, with the express intent of infecting them. Because 
they had no natural immunity to smallpox. Um, and so, particularly in, in the, I know of some villages in the, the Kansas, Nebraska area, Mandan villages in the 1800s where smallpox came through and you'd have a village of 500 people and you go back two weeks later and there'd be 50 people alive. And certain tribes literally got wiped out by European diseases. Most times not by intent, but there were times where it was intentional. Yes, sir. years ago I interviewed him on my once a month TV program. He talked about their first contact with Western man was the Jesuits in the 16th century mm -hmm. and converted them virtually all to Catholicism. And there was nothing in their fundamental religious beliefs that conflicted with Christianity. Then he spoke about the next contact with the Europeans was a group of Spanish, French, map maker explorers who had, in November 1698, came to the Sabine and started exploring back east towards the Mississippi. They knew a lot about everything east of the Mississippi, there was nothing of west. So as they came along the shore, there were fires around branching air. So they put their skips overboard and came in by the Indians. So the Indians told them all about where you can get fresh water, and junior tea was important because it had Asian wells. You know, and I, and I interrupted and said, there's no way the French Spanish could talk to the Indians as a language barrier. No, he said, 10 years before, two Spanish cabin boys, nine or 10 years old, walked up alive on the beach, and the Takamatsu came in and took care of it. So, they could handle the language there. They spoke a lot about the Vermilion Bay, the Vermilion Fire, was their pass north. When they when they'd leave for the summer, they followed those rivers and they could take the Vermilion into the Chad, into Catawba, and all the way up the Red River. And, and uh, the two boys, of course, they took them back, I guess, to wherever. One of them wrote a book about his 10 year, 10 years living with the town. I'd love to know what that book was. It's an interesting part of our history and we'll leave that. <coughs> Right, so perhaps I wasn't clear. <clears throat> what I was saying was people came to the Chenier's as soon as they started, you know, as soon as the vegetation got on this little Chenier, they moved out there first. Probably the oldest sites are there. I don't think people ever fully left the Chenier plain. Um, what I was saying was at the Morgan site, we know that they were living there, building those mounds between 800 and 1,000. And at some point after 1,000, it appears like they left that particular site and did not did not live there anymore. I'm not saying that they left the Chenier's entirely. They may have just gone two miles down the road and you know set up camp again. Um, we don't really know. Um, but yes, you're very right. People continue to live down here. And it's, as he was referencing, you know, some of the earliest accounts we have of Spanish and French explorers is there were groups of people living in the Chenier Plain and along the Vermilion and the Sabine and the Calcasieu Rivers. So the place was not abandoned. It's just certain sites were abandoned at certain points of time and people stopped living at that particular location. Yes, I mean, a lot of people in this room might actually have some Indian blood. There was a lot of intermarriage and intermixing, um, you know, over the years. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. 
sir. Oh, uh, question for the group. Uh, how many here tonight are actually from Pecan Island or our ancestors are from Pecan, aside from? Mm -hmm. Looks like there's yeah, eight or nine folks from Pecan Island. My parents, yes, my father. <laughs> well, perhaps I should talk to some of you because one of the stories that we hear is that at some point in the early mid 1900s, there's always been an interest in John Lafitte and where he buried his gold. <laughs> And actually, at one time when I was at UL, I had a guy, a Cajun guy, come to me, and to even to this day, I still can barely understand him. Um, but he swore that he knew where the fleet ship was in White Lake, and he promised to take me out there. And he, he never came back, unfortunately. But what I was going to say was, the reason I'd like to talk to some of you is to shake my finger at you, because one of the stories you'll hear is that sometime in the 30s or 40s, several people thought, that Lafitte must have buried his gold in an Indian mound, because that would be a very obvious marker, it'd be easy to find, to come back to. So they tunneled into it, planted a bunch of dynamite, and blew the mound up, hoping that gold doubloons would come flying out of the air. I don't know which mound that was. If I ever find out, and I know who the landowner is, I'm going to come talk to you. But... <laughs> It does not. And it's not protected in any way. Nope. But if you drive by and, and you want to visit it, can anybody? Uh, you'd have to ask the landowner's permission, you know, otherwise you're trespassing. But you can drive by it. I mean, it's only 10 feet off the highway. You can't miss it. And how do the mounds here compare to the mounds at LSU? Um, well, the mounds at LSU are somewhere between five and 6,000 years old. So. One of the things you might not know about Louisiana history, and this gives me an opportunity to say, up here on the table, we have a series of six posters that talk about the, the last 12,000 years of Louisiana's Indian history, so you can come up and look. But Louisiana has the oldest Indian mounds from anywhere in North America. One of the things we are first in. <laughs> and the oldest mound, um, that we know of actually lay just at the north side of Baton Rouge, the place called the Monte Sano site. Um, and it, the first mound there was built almost 7,000 years ago. And so along the Mississippi River Valley, um, between about 7,000 and about 5,000 years ago, there are at least 13 sites that we know of where people were building mounds in that time period. Um, this is long before people were building mounds anywhere else in North America. Why they started here? What? The Cahokia Mound in Illinois. Cahokia Mounds, that was, those were built between about 800 and 12, 1300 AD. They're, they're very late in the picture. Of course, they did it on a spectacular basis. I mean, there were something like 135, 140 mounds at Cahokia at one point. There's no other site in North America quite like it. And they had two Mormon mounds. Well, there were originally four. Well, there was two left. In the 80s, they tore one down. The left yeah. Down. yeah, he tore yeah. both of them down, ultimately. But no, there's still one on the Mormon. Yeah, there is still one there. There were originally four. One disappeared when they built the highway, and then the landowner sold two. And the third one belonged to a different landowner, and so that one's still there. He had to get permission before he could do anything. Yeah. And I think I think someone went and checked it out before they dug it all up. But I don't know either. Okay, yeah, I mean, as, as I looked at the, the, you know, I showed you that map of the other mounds. There are other groups of mounds, either one or two, along Front Ridge there. And on the Ulysses Dizze property, they had mounds. Oh, yes. Through it. We, that's yep. where the road was. We could touch the mounds as we drive through. Yep. There used to be at least 11, maybe 14 mounds there. But I don't know if they still there because um, I don't know. Yep. Uh, Only one of them still Sonia, exists. Charles Sonia bought property there, so, and all of them. So, uh, is he here? Yeah. Charles is here. Is he yes. Charles? Charles Sonia? Is the big one? 
She's asking if there are any mounds left at Bizet. Okay. Yeah, the one back in the woods, is that gone now? Well, this was on the ridge of the front ridge. Right, yeah, there used to be some, but I know it's gone because I've driven up and down. Well, we used to play there. <laughs> when we brought the car. No, but anybody can have a marker put up. Uh, you can, I, if you're interested, I can put you in touch with the person in the Office of Tourism who oversees the state marker program. Basically, it just means you get to pay for it. Um, but you can have a marker put up. One more, one more, two more questions. Was there, was there any human relics available that anybody did any DNA test on that? Um, no. Henry Collins did not keep any uh, from his excavations. As I say, there were some human remains found in, in, 80, in 86, um, but um, nobody has come forward with a proposal to do DNA testing. The problem with that is the DNA per se doesn't, you could do the DNA on the bones, but all you get back is, you know, a list of chemicals. Unless you have a population to compare it to and say, is it the, is it the same DNA sequence as, the, say, the Chittimacha or the Atacapa, you don't know who it belongs to. Um, so you have to have those comparative samples in order for DNA to make any sense. You had one more question? So if you take LA-82 from Abbeville down to Pecan Island, um, you go through the marsh and then you swing onto a ridge. And as you drive down that ridge, uh, you just keep your eyes open on the right-hand side of the road. I mean, it's literally only 10 or 15 feet off the highway. You, you can't, if you're looking for a bump on the ground, it's the only rise there is. <laughs> Thank you so much. We owe these two people a greater debt of gratitude than just this presentation. Uh, some of you remember Ms. Osh came down and met with us, and it was all a matter of uh, going over the title or ownership of the artifacts that we have, and uh, it was clear by their records and ours that the Maine Historical Society is the owner of the artifacts. Most of them are stored in Baton Rouge with them, they have the means of uh, preserving and protecting it, but uh, we are thinking about a trip that we might take to Baton Rouge to see some of that, and they said they'd be glad to have us. The other thing that both of these people, Dr. McGimsey and Carlos, came down and helped us move artifacts from the library in Kaplan to our present site here in the Cultural Center uh, at Magdalen Square. So they've really been a big help to us, and we thank them for more than what they did tonight. We're going to be picking up chairs just to get things back in order, but we'd invite you to take a look at all the displays, excuse me, 